We are so grateful to be alive, to be here with you, be here with our church body, fellowshipping, worshiping you, receiving your word of encouragement. And Lord, we just are grateful for the sunshine in the sky and the birds in the air, Lord, everything that points to you. Help us to prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls for deep, deep worship this morning, Lord. Help to fix our mind and our eyes on you and tune our hearts to your spirit. Thank you for all the hard working people that come here every Sunday and prepare. And people who pray throughout the week for this church, Lord, for the upcoming service, for the people in this church that are hurting, for the different ministries in this church, Lord. And when we come together, And we pray in your name and by your spirit, Lord. You move mountains. And we recognize that this morning, Lord, that we have to fix our eyes on you every day because we need you every hour. We need you every minute. All right, all right, it's time to lift him up. I was walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. 
Then I saw lightning from heaven And I've never been the same I'm gonna climb a mountain I'm gonna shout about it I am a child of love I found a world of freedom I found a friend of Jesus I am a child of love I felt the sting of the fire But I saw you in the flame Just when I thought it was over You broke me out of the grave I'm gonna climb a mountain I'm gonna shout about it I am a child of love I found the world of freedom I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. Yeah. Oh. I am a child of love. Yeah. Oh. I am a child of love. Nothing can change the way you love. Nothing can change the way I belong to you Yes, I do Nothing can separate Nothing can change the way you love me Nothing can change the way I belong to you Yes, I do Nothing can separate I'm gonna climb a mountain I am a child of love I found a world of freedom I am a child of love I'm gonna climb a mountain I'm gonna shout about it I am a child of love I found a world of freedom I found a friend in Jesus I am a child of love I'm gonna climb a mountain I'm gonna shout about it I am a child of love I found a world of freedom I found a friend in Jesus I am a child of love yeah. Oh, I am a child of love. Yeah. Oh, I am a child of Father, once again, we just are grateful we can all be here and we can worship you together. Lord, we pray that you would hear our praises and you would hear the cry of our hearts, Lord, for you, because we need you. We want you. We want to know you better. We want to be closer to you after today and for the, every day of the rest of our lives, Lord. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow Praise Him all creatures here below Praise Him above ye heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
adore. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now with us. Every moment, all our days, God be praised, oh God be praised. Praise God with morning's breaking light. Praise Him through darkness of the night. Praise Him with every breath of life. Praise Him, my soul. the Son, praise the Spirit now with us, every moment, all our days, God be praised, oh God be say amen. amen amen can we do that last chord again i i thought like you weren't quite sure it was there let me give you the notes and brian's gonna lead us in an amen everybody's got to do it amen. which is a way of saying to god make it happen make it so father thank you that you are the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end. You're the great amen, the one that makes it happen. 
we stand in awe today in light of some of the things coming up in our message of this amazing universe that we live in that seems to have been designed so one planet, <laughs> this little speck, third planet from the sun could have life. Life that's intelligent and emotional and passionate and able to respond to the creator. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the capacity that we have to love and to worship, and we choose to focus that love on you today. So we gather to exalt you more than anything else. We lift your name high up today. Friend of Alliance Church is a place that honors the God of Scripture, honors the Lord Jesus of history who came and taught and died and was raised on the third day, seen by hundreds of people who testified and gave up their lives because of that great historical truth that validates all that we believe and do, Lord. So we thank you for our church. We pray together for all believers around our world that, us, that are worshiping. We pray for the believers that are suffering, that are going through persecution in many places, that you would be gracious and kind and provide remedy for their suffering, Lord. We thank you for our missionaries that serve us around the world. And uh, we thank you for Judy, who regularly gives us mission moments in our bulletin to remember to pray for our workers. And I just want to lift up all the Alliance workers right now that serve us around the world. We are grateful for them as they have uh, struggled to co uh, combat, combat the barriers of COVID and international issues and still faithfully serve you. And we give you thanks for missionaries have, who've come out of this church to serve you, Lord. May that continue to be part of our legacy. So God, just take a moment, Lord, just to take our hearts, the brokenness that we bring to church sometimes, the joy that we bring to church sometimes. I pray this morning, especially for a friend of mine whose daughter um, OD'd on uh, fentanyl here in Ferndale, and uh, it's just shocking. Uh, a, a youngster that was loved and cared for and blessed as an adopted child and it makes that terrible decision to make choices like that, Lord. I pray for this church, that we would be wise in our parenting, we would be wise in our youth leading, that we'd be wise in our growing up to not mess with things that we know are harmful because they don't just hurt us as individuals, they hurt our friends and our family. So I pray for this particular family that you'd reach out and touch them and heal the heart and grief that they're going through, Lord. So be with us today, Lord. We celebrate that Jesus is risen, and we walk in that resurrection today. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's give a welcome to Steve. He's going to do the morning announcements, I believe. There you go, Steve. Let people know that you're glad they're up here. It's not an easy job. <laughs> Good morning, church. God is good. And all the time. So I just love already the tone that has been set this morning. I enjoyed that last song, and I just love what it did personally for my heart, was just put me at peace and calm. And it already sets the tone. It just tells me that God is at work already because um, I didn't communicate with what songs they were going to sing, but I just love that it set this tone of thought that I was thinking. When I was asked to do announcements, <clears throat> I usually start thinking about what's going on in my life and some, some uh, instant that God has done, and I want to bring it to you guys and share it to you with you. But this morning, <clears throat> or this last couple of days, God did something different. He said, Steve, I don't want you to share no personal story. I just want you to go up and share the word that I've put before you. But also, <clears throat> I want you to do a little exercise with everybody. And <clears throat> I'm not asking you to get up and do push-ups or any of those things. But it goes with the tone that I just felt that song did. It just, that song just made me want to close my eyes and just feel the spirit. So this morning... I'm going to read to you from Proverbs uh, 3, and it's uh, verses 5 through, um, I think, 11. But um, I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes and just take a moment and just think about whatever's happening in your life right now, whether it's something exciting, something that is good, whether it's a trial that you're facing, whether... Um, no matter what it is, 
Some of us are parents, and we have our hands full. Some of us are spouses, and we have our hands full. <laughs> or things are just going great, right? But I want to just hear these words and trust. <clears throat> so please close your eyes and just listen. This is from the message version. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim over. But don't, dear friend, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. It's the child he loves that God corrects. A father delights. A father's delight is behind all of this. And church, can we just close with together saying, amen, amen. So <clears throat> I hope that encourages you, and I hope it opens up your heart to receive the rest of the Sunday worship. Um, so for announcements, we have youth group tonight, again, 5.45 p.m., um, <clears throat> Tuesdays are men's and women's, 6.30 p.m. Also, Friday night, we have started back up prayer night, which is from 6.15 to 7.15 right here. Um, and then next Sunday, we have our soup Sunday. Invite a friend, come hungry, always good food. Um, so that is announcements. I will ask the offertorians to come up. I will pray for our offering, and then once I sit down, Russ is going to come up and do the science moment. So, also any children can be dismissed at this time. So, Father in heaven, we just give you thanks and praise, Lord, and um, we want to give our first fruits to you today. We want to ask you to multiply them and bless your king for your kingdom and your glory, Lord. Please accept our offerings and our humble hearts, Lord. We just praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. What a terrible picture. Um, <laughs> glad I'm facing this way. Um, anyway, this is a time for our science moment. And uh, this week, I'm not going to do another body part. But uh, I read a, a book, I actually wrote two books several years ago called Icons of Evolution. It's by Dr. Jonathan Wells. And what he did is he, all these stories that when they teach evolution, believe it or not, they teach it through stories, very few facts. And they take a few facts and extrapolate it out. And so he, in this book, he looked at, you know, the primordial pond that supposedly life appeared from and how that couldn't have happened and, uh, you know, the whole peppered moth thing. And anyway, so he, uh, the Piltdown Man, all these hoaxes and false stories, and he, he shatters them. But one he didn't cover, but I, I heard many times and when I was learning about evolution and having to teach it, is the evolution of a giraffe. Everyone heard that one? Where they uh, supposedly, uh, one was born with a longer neck so it could get a little bit higher in the branches. And uh, so then that gave him an advantage and it was more attractive to the females they propose. And so he was able to reproduce more. And after a thousand years, voila, they had a 600 pound, six foot long giraffe neck. But, uh, the devil's in the details, because uh, when you look at that, first of all, researchers have studied giraffes, and they actually eat lower on the branches. They don't eat high up, even in droughts. 
Um, and then they've also found, uh, you know, not just a long neck, but think about it. His head is eight feet from his heart. He's got to pump blood all the way up that neck to get blood to his brain. Then what happens when he goes to get a drink of water? He drops it down. All that blood is going to rush down there. So now I have to have a mechanism to reduce the blood pressure, a management system, and that helped control fainting and strokes. Um, and also giraffes are a ruminant. As Eric told us about cows, they regurgitate up uh, their, their food, and then they, they chew it again a second time, and uh, it helps them to digest that fibrous grass and leaves and stuff like that. But they had to pull off this trick with a neck as tall as, taller than I am, which is not hard, but... Um, so they had to have a, a special muscular esophagus to not only swallow the food, but to bring it all the way back up that uh, six feet. Then they have to breathe. And if a man tried to breathe with an eight-foot neck, he'd die. Not from lack of oxygen, but because of the residual carbon dioxide that's in his neck. But a giraffe has a special breathing pattern. They breathe really slow and deep, and that recycles that air, and uh, so they, they can survive. Uh, also, they're having that high blood pressure uh, to get that oxygen up to their, their head. That means their legs, which are way down there, they're going to have such high pressure in there that it would force the blood out of the capillaries of their legs, and they'd die. But they have special uh, fluid in between their cells at the same high pressure that prevents that, which also means they have to have super strong impermeable skin so that it doesn't leak out of there. So in addition to all these uh, changes and hundreds more like them, they may, uh, also have to have posture reflexes and new strategies to escape from predators. So it's evident that the giraffe's long neck necessitated not just one mutation, but many, and these perfectly coordinated. Blind evolution doesn't look ahead and coordinate a group of changes for some future advantage. It's blind and must proceed one small useful step at a time. But what if loads of changes are needed to simultaneously successfully make a biological transition, like in a giraffe? All those different functions had to appear all at the same time. So we know that uh, one type of cause to meet this challenge, and it is not dumb luck and natural selection, it's the engineering marvel. Uh, the, the giraffe's long neck and all was intelligently designed by an incredibly awesome God. And I believe that God designed every plant, animal, fungi, and bacteria with special attributes that make it perfectly fit into its habitat. And I do believe in natural selection. It is a fact, and that's what they often teach, that, you know, like the peppered moths, the, you know, this, this ash on the trees, and they turn black, and then the, they get away the pollution, and they, they turn back to white. So natural uh, selection occurs within species, and I, God gave them that ability to adapt, the variety in our genes to adapt as needed. And the, even the, um, the Darwin finches, you may have heard on the Galapagos Islands, that they've seen them, but when it comes to drought, their beaks get uh, thicker so they can get the harder seeds and stuff. And then what they found is that after about five years after the drought ends, they all revert back to their natural small beaks. So they're, within species, we can all adapt, and it's, it's, a, it's something that God gave us. And I like to point out the dogs. Think of all the breeds of dogs. You got uh, St. Bernard's, Cocker Spaniels and Chihuahuas, all the different breeds, some really weird breeds. But you put them in a, a pen together and let them breed for about three or four generations, they're all going to look like the typical mutt, you know, medium-sized, fawn-colored, short fur, and a curved tail. And uh, so, but th that's what evolutionists do is they take that well, there's natural selection, so they extrapolate it out to that changes within species, and there's just no proof for that. And I, uh, I have to fight that every day. <laughs> but anyway, I just think God is a master designer and engineer, 
and I, for one, love studying his designs. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Send me a better picture, I'll put it up there, but that's all I can find. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Let's continue to worship the Lord this morning. Let's stand together, and you don't have to stand, but it's kind of nice. You can worship any way that you want.
we want. You're all we ever need. You are all that we ever love. You are all that we ever desire. We have so many earthly things that we might think that we want or need or desire. And some of those things are important, Lord. But nothing can even touch the importance that you have in our lives. We literally cannot move without you intervening with our muscles and with our hearts beating. We literally cannot see anything without your works in us. This whole world is going to be really dim without your beauty that has been surrounding us through generations and generations and generations. And we can't even speak or sing or worship without you putting that breath in our mouths and in our, in our lungs. And we cannot fall to our knees like we will right now without you intervening in us and for us. And I pray that you allow us to just fall down on our knees, fall down on our faces like the angels do and allow us to worship you with all that we've got and with every breath we give. And it's your name I pray, amen. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, holy, holy. Is the land. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb.
Lord, now be with us as we take a good part of our morning to look at the word, your scripture, Lord. Bless us now as we um, discover together what you did through Paul in this amazing city of Athens, Greece, the current capital of Greece, a city that goes way back with a great history of intellectual giants, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. It was kind of the university city of the world, the Princeton and Harvard and Yale and MIT and everything else crammed together. And, and some of their ideas um, were true and some were not true, but uh, it attracted people who were thinkers and liked to think and debate and argue. And we get to read here about their first confrontation with Christianity and another truly intellectual giant by any measure, the Apostle Paul, who was brilliant and logical and keen and knowledgeable not just knowledgeable about his Jewish religion, we note here his references to pagan Greek philosophers uh, shows remarkable breadth of knowledge and wisdom that he had. So Lord, we want to grow, we want to learn. We want to learn how we can um, approach our culture. Very similar culture that they had in Athens in the first century. Um, large segment of our population that uh, values knowledge and wisdom and insights and philosophy, but don't know you, Lord. And that's what Paul is facing here. So bless us now as we read your word, as we study it together for Jesus' sake. And everybody said together, amen. amen. Find your Bibles. Turn to Acts chapter 17. We are finishing up chapter 17 today, as you might imagine. And what that does for us is that next week we're going to start, uh, uh, excuse me, the week after, start the book of Thessalonians um, because we just covered some territory in the book of Acts that dealt with this church at Thessalonica. So uh, we've been doing this, going through the book of Acts and taking breaks here and there to uh, cover different things. And so finishing up chapter 17 today, you might remember the earlier part of chapter 17. We've looked at two churches already, the church at Thessalonica. I want you to listen to this comment about Paul's ministry to the church at Thessalonica, which is in Greece. These churches, these cities are all very close together. It says, as was his custom, and I'm in verse 2, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the what? Do you remember what the word was there? From the scriptures. It wasn't Plato's Republic. <laughs> it wasn't the latest self-help book by Tony Robbins. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. That is the church at Thessalonica. Gets there, notices that there is a synagogue, a Jewish place of worship, and he goes in there, opens up the scriptures. And then we note that he then has to leave Thessalonica, goes to Berea, and we have this comment not about Paul, but about the Bereans. It says that now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the Scriptures, yeah, every day to see if what Paul said was true. I suggested maybe this was the first fact checkers. Uh, you know, people, okay, what's he saying? Is that really in the Bible? Is that really in Isaiah? Is that really in the Psalms? And they were fact checking Paul. And it says they were noble because they did that. And I suggested last week that we are noble when we listen and filter everything through the scriptures that God has given us, right? Because we value the scriptures so much. So we would expect scriptures to dominate Paul's evangelistic ministry. And I want you to listen very carefully. We're going to read together this section on this effort to start ministry in churches in Athens. And I want you to notice how many times scriptures are either mentioned as a totality or a, an Old Testament scripture that is quoted or referenced. You ready to do that? So we're in Acts chapter 17. Paul's just finished up in Berea. He's left behind Two people, Silas and Timothy, and this is how it begins. I want you to again just count up the number of times the, the Old Testament scriptures, there weren't New Testament scriptures yet, are mentioned in this chapter. It says this. While 
Paul was waiting for them in Athens. Uh, he's in Athens and his friends are still in Berea. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. These would be Greek citizens, non-Jewish people that were moving in that direction of embracing monotheism, monotheism a single God in the Jewish tradition. And also, he, 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 it says as well, he was in the marketplace, kind of a public market, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, you don't need to know who these people are, except that they did not believe in a personal God. The uh, Epicureans, this was a philosophy that was about 300 years old, they sort of believed in enjoying life. They, were, they weren't um, totally paganistic or hedonistic, but they said, enjoy life. Enjoy life, whereas the Stoics, they would endure life. See the difference? Enjoy life if you're an Epicurean, uh, endure life if you're a Stoic. Neither one of them believed in a personal present God. And that's, what important, that's what's important to know, and that's who Paul was dealing with here. They began to debate with Paul, and some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods, gods that we have never heard of before. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And some people think the, the language there uh, that Paul might be actually promoting two gods, a god named Jesus and a god named resurrection. The, the language might suggest that as opposed to what Paul was really doing was teaching that Jesus was the god of the resurrection. But they thought, you know, kind of like join the club. We, we got a bunch of gods here in Athens. You got a couple more gods that we've never heard of before, foreign gods. So they took him, and they brought him to the meeting, to a meeting of the Areopagus, which you probably know as well as Mars Hill. You've any of you heard of Mars Hill? There is a whole church franchise denomination called Mars Hill. Um, that's where it gets its name from, this confrontation in Athens. Where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is so that, uh, that you are presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears. And we would like to know what they mean. And I like this next verse. It's just kind of odd to me. It says, all the Athenians and the foreigners who spent their time there, they spent their time there doing nothing but talking and listening to the latest ideas. Doesn't sound contemporary to you? <laughs> People that spend all their time just kind of, uh, I, they're trolls. These are the first origins of trolls. People would just, you know, hanging around and arguing and bickering and, and debating and not, it says they're not doing anything. They're not accomplishing anything produ productive. They just like to spin out. In fact, they just like to argue for the sake of arguing. Anybody got anybody like that in your life? <laughs> I do. It's in my, in my other life that's more of a political life. I know people, that all they want to do is argue, and I just... Shut them down. I don't have time for that. If you want to do something productive, let me know. These are the, this is the first trolls is what I'm saying. Then verse 22. Paulman stood up in the meeting at the Arapagus, if I say that right, Arapagus, and he said, people of Athens, I see that in every way. You are very religious. And that's actually kind of a neutral, almost a complimentary term. You, you're obviously very religious. And for as I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, and it says this, to an unknown God. And every once in a while we look at the Greek a little bit, and the phrase unknown God are two words that you know in English, agnostos, agnostic, right? And theos, or theo for God, an unknown God. So you are ignorant also the verb agnoeo, agnoeo, we get the word agnostic, of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And actually, scholars tell us there were a number of altars and temples and religious sites that had this phrase, to the unknown God, because in case we missed one, we want to include the rest of them in this catch-all uh, safety net. And I said in the title of the message, they were hedging their bets, make sure they didn't leave out a God. God, yours is right there. We just didn't know your name. Then verse 24, 
The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needs, any, needs anything from us. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and histories and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for them and find him, though he's not far from any of us. For in him, and now Paul is quoting one or two Greek philosophers. You don't need to know their names. I forgot their names already. But they were, these are kind of common sayings that he, uh, he was aware of in this Greek society that he could agree with and use as a, a launching point for his message. They said this, for in him, this God, we live and we move and we have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. And if you think about it, if you just thought about it for a minute, how could the God of the universe be contained in a cup or a glass or a house or a building? Say, think about it. You just say, it's just common sense that a God who could create all of this could not possibly be contained in anything. We'll come back to that. Now, it says in verse 3 that God overlooks such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to, what's the next word? Repent. We know too much. We know too much not to repent. And it's a reminder here that God overlooked a lot of stuff that people believed in ignorance. But we don't have to be ignorant today, especially in light of things that we learn like from Russ in our church. This is the amazing world that we live in continuously at many levels points to a creator, generous and benevolent and patient God. Verse 31, for he has said a day that he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, that be Jesus Christ. And he's given proof of this to everyone by what? Raising him from the dead. We've got two references to resurrection in this passage, and they are key to Paul's argument. Now, when they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some of them sneered which is easy to imagine. Anybody have, a, have anyone sneer at you before? It's not fun, is it? It says somebody, they sneered, but others said, you know, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at this, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul, which happened, and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. So my question at the beginning was, how many did you, times did you hear scripture quoted or referred to in that paragraph? Zero. <laughs> There's no reference at all to scriptures. And I believe that's intentional on Paul's part. What he's doing here, and I mentioned this last week. You, you, how many of you have done this before? To, you shared your faith with somebody, you shared the gospel with somebody, you tried to let, let people know the way of salvation, and you start quoting scripture and their eyes glazed over because they simply don't believe scripture. That scripture can be a good place to share the gospel as a starting point for people who are religious, people who have a background in church or Christianity, people who maybe grew up in a legalistic church have not found freedom in Christ, or people who have maybe been involved with a cult or something like that. And you can oftentimes use a cultist's own scripture to lead someone to Christ. But in our society today, as it was in Athens, there are a lot of people that simply don't believe the scripture. Then what do you do? You're not stuck, but you can't start with scripture. What does Paul focus on? Well, he mentions it twice here. He focuses on a historical event. And what was that event? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. I wrote down a quote. Let's see if I can find you. Andy Stanley says this. And I mentioned this in a probably not as artful a way last week. I fully believe in scriptures. I believe in the integrity, the unity, the truthfulness, the authority, the reliability of scripture. But I do that not because the church told me to believe that. 
I do that because Christ believes that. Okay, does that make sense? I start with Christ the way Paul starts with Christ. And Stanley says this about this issue of resurrection. He says, says it so much better than me. He says, if a man can predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off, well, I just go wherever that man says. Let me say that again. I buy this. I do. If a man can predict his own death and resurrection, which Jesus historically did, there's a lot of documents that, that tell us that, and he pulls it off, I just go with whatever that man says. Well, you say, but pastor, isn't that kind of a circular reasoning logic? No, it's not. We start with the scriptures, the New Testament documents, 27 of them, as independent pieces of work historically describing things that took place. And you come to a conclusion that they are compelling. Now, if you choose not to believe, that's fine. But I think the historical evidence is compelling that this man, Jesus Christ, came, lived amongst us, taught and preached. He was captured and, and suffered and tortured and put to death on a cross, died on that cross under Pontius Pilate, historically it says. But on the third day, witnesses came out. And they weren't the normal witnesses that we would expect. The witnesses were women. And at the time, if you want to establish something in court, it was not women that you brought forth as witnesses. But the script, so let me say it this way. If you were going to make this up, if you're going to make this story up, first of all, you wouldn't make the apostles look so wimpy, so weeny, so afraid, and so scattered, right? They don't look that great in the gospel narratives, do they? It's the women that have the courage that go to the tomb and it's empty and they proclaim that. It's impossible to imagine a, not just one but four gospels presenting the story that way. Then you have this person named Paul who's so amazingly effective. We, I honestly believe that we are here today in this church and churches around the world because of what Paul did. His influence in starting churches in the Middle East and in the in, in Eastern Europe, and then eventually wanting to get all the way to Spain. He at least got to Rome. This guy was amazing what he did. And his life story only makes sense if what he saw was true. A resurrected Christ that said, follow me. Follow me. It's pretty powerful stuff. So Jesus, when you read the narratives, start from, just start from the texts, believe in Scripture. He, over and over again, says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And he continually referenced people in the Old Testament, like Jonah, three days in the belly. Like Moses, you've heard Moses say, Abraham, Noah, Jesus referred to these as real people, again, validating the scriptures. So I start with Jesus, and because Jesus believed the scriptures, it's good enough for me. So it's a consistent view of his authority, but the authority of Scripture over me, not the authority of a church or a group of people that decide that Scriptures are authoritative. We're not, we don't decide that. We simply affirm, affirm the truthfulness of it. So I'm going to follow this guy wherever he goes, and he says, follow Scripture. I'm going to follow Scripture as, as orthodox. So what we have in this passage, I think, are some great keys for us to learn about sharing Christ. Can we look at some together? There are not very many, and you can follow along here. The first thing I mentioned earlier, um, if you're one of those fill-in-the-blank kind of people, is when sharing Jesus, know when to and when not to use Scripture. We've covered that, right? Start, and this is where we have to have some faith. Paul consistently went to the resurrection, argued the resurrection historically. He does that in 1 Corinthians 15, when he says, he, uh, Jesus first appeared to Peter, to James, to the rest, and finally to me, 500 at a time. That's a historical argument. He appeared to many people, and if it wasn't true, they could have batted that, that lie down in a hurry. They could have just simply showed the body or any number of things to, to dispel that rumor. They couldn't because it was true, the resurrection. So you have to decide when to use Scripture and when not to use Scripture. And again, you can quickly tell. You can tell you start using verses like John 3, 16. You know, it's going to work or it's not going to work. But behind all of it is the truth of the resurrection. That gets people's attention. You mean this person was killed and he was raised up and he says his followers can be raised up as well. 
that ought to get people's attention. And I believe in sharing the gospel that the Holy Spirit keys in on that truth more than any other truth, okay? We don't need to get off on tangents on um, peripheral issues surrounding our faith, but focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here are some keys. From verse 16, we learn that to be, an, to be effective as Christians and as a church, we need a passion for the lost, and we need, a, we need to be fearless and unashamed. We have to have a passion for the lost and we need, be, we need to be fearless and unashamed. Notice verse 16. Paul goes to this city, may have been his first visit, and he looks around and he goes, what a mess. <laughs> He sees idols everywhere. Now, he's perhaps used to going to cities with synagogues that, that at least had enough Jewish influence that he felt at home. He really felt in a foreign land here as he looked in this city and saw all the idols. It says, and, and the NIV kind of tones it down a little bit, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. It ripped out his heart to see that. And I think the reason Paul was fearless and able to share the gospel was he had he really was a believer that people are lost without christ he looked around and goes there are a lot of lost people in this great city i think that's a prayer we ought to have for ourselves lord give me a passion for the lost may it trouble me and bother me that my family my friends my neighbors my co-workers are lost and consigned without jesus to a christless eternity Sometimes we need God to do a work in our lives and go, wow, Lord, give me a passion for the lost. We, we intellectually have a passion. I believe this, and so I'm going to share Jesus. No, just to have that emotional passion, spiritual passion for those that need to know Jesus Christ. The next uh, key to sharing comes in verse 17, where it says that he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks in the Jewish setting, but then also in the marketplace. So he, he was willing to go anywhere. And I like the word that's used here. It says he reasoned with them. We saw this word earlier in the chapter. He dialogued with them. Or he had a conversation with them. And a conversation is more effective than a lecture, right? It's easy to lecture people. It's easy to, to yell at people. It's easy to beat people up with the Bible. It says here, he reasoned with them, which suggests that it went, basically, it was a Socrates' method, method of teaching, back and forth questions, right? This is the Greek method of, of persuading someone is to have a conversation, and he reasoned with them day by day. So that's better than a lecture. The next key is found in verse 18, and we mentioned this already. In verse 18, it says, um, he seems to be, advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And the key principle is this. Our primary focus and message amongst all the stuff, we know we might talk to people about their family life. We might talk to them about contemporary morality and the struggles of culture. We might talk to people about scientific issues like we talk about here in our church. But it needs to come back to be about the resurrected Jesus. Our primary focus and message should be about the resurrected Jesus. I would suggest that if we don't cover the Easter weekend, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we haven't quite got the full gospel out to our friends. The next principle is found in verses 19 through 21, which is that Paul stayed focused on the resurrection and caught their ears. They were interested. They wanted to hear from Paul. They asked him some questions. You're saying some stuff that's different to us. We're interested. Share some more. And I believe that Paul stayed focused on the resurrected life. And again, I'm going to quote Stanley again. It's the key to everything. It's not necessarily answering all the cultists' questions. It's not necessarily trying to unravel all the apparent supposed contradictions in the Bible. It's not necessary to figure out how science and faith goes together. You start with Jesus. Again, if a man can predict his own death and resurrection, resurrection and pull it off, I just go with whatever that man says. In verse 22 through 23, another really important principle as we're sharing the gospel with people is that Paul found important common ground with the Athenians. He found important common ground with the Athenians. I love reading these two verses. 
Verse 22, Paul stood up in the meeting at the Areopagus, and he said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, as I am. And as I walked through and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this in Scripture, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and that's what I wanted to, to proclaim to you. See Paul trying to find common ground. He found something of theirs, an idol that had unknown God written on it. So he thought, I can use that as an illustration. I can use that as a hook. I can use it to share. You know, we are both religious. We're trying to find truth, and we're trying to find, find God. And it occurred to me when I thought about these people in Athens, you know, think about the humor of that. They've got, everything's got a God, you know, all this pantheon of both Greek and Roman gods. But they're afraid they missed one. We might have missed one, and we don't want that God to be angry with us. So we have this, this idol for the unknown God, and they were all over the place. It wasn't just one. And I, don't you call that kind of hedging your bets? Right? You all know what that means, whether you're a gambler, sport, voting on. It's like when you vote against your own team, right? When you bet against your own team, kind of hedging your bets because you kind of know what's going to happen. It's when you are an investor and you say, well, I'm not going to put it all here. I'm going to divide up. Whereas we know Christianity wants 100%. These guys were hedging their bets. And I wonder if Christians, we do that sometimes. We do hedging our bets by shifting to works. You know, I think just I'm gonna make I'm gonna make sure I do these things because I want God to like me more. I want to make sure I get to heaven, so I'm gonna give more. I'm gonna serve more. I'm gonna sacrifice more. I'm gonna go to church more. We do a bunch of things that maybe are good, but we do them from the wrong reason because we're trying to impress God. We're trying to hedge our bets, and that's what these religious people were doing. And Paul's gonna say to them, "You don't need to do that." And in finding this common ground. I think Paul illustrates some obvious truths about the world that we live in. Notice verse 24. It's almost like Paul doesn't need to say this about the world that he's going to quickly examine, kind of from a scientific perspective. Verse 24 says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands. That seems kind of self-evident. You just grasp at the time in the first century, kind of maybe understanding the size of the world, perhaps, looking out in the stars and the planets, perhaps, and grasping it a little bit. You think, how could this planet possibly contain a God who made absolutely everything? And I think that applies to us today as well. Do you ever, and I do this sometimes, try to imagine the size of the universe? I'm going to try to help you with numbers. Can I do that? Just a little bit here. Light years. A light year is simply the distance that light travels in a year, right? <laughs> a light year, which is a long ways. The distance be between here, our planet, and Jupiter, and we can see Jupiter on a clear night. It's a big, looks like a big star up there. It's about 45 minutes away in terms of the traveling of light. 45 minutes is a lot less than a year, okay? We now are able to look at the next galaxy. Our galaxy is the Milky Way galaxy, right? The next galaxy is called Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy, and it is 25,000 light years from our sun. What does that mean? Well, when we look at it through these new telescopes, the Hubble and the James Webb, we're, we're looking at the galaxy as it was 25,000 years ago. It might not even still be there today, but that's a long, stinking way. And that's just the next galaxy. The next one after that is called Sagittarius, dwarf elliptical galaxy, and it is 70,000 light years from us. With the advent, think about this. Just try to, okay, I'm going to mine, my mind, start with Earth, I'm going to go past the sun, going to cast Mars and a few more planets. There's Jupiter. It's a big one, about 45 minutes if we're traveling at the speed of light. Good luck with that. And we keep going. We thousands and thousands of years, speed of light go by, light years go by, and we just hit the first new galaxy adjacent to our galaxy. Now with the advent of Hubble and James Webb Telescope, there's not just a couple galaxies out there. 
there are billions of galaxies. Okay, you kind of got that in your head. Now, try to grab it all, the size of it all. It's big, it's really big. It's even bigger than you think it's big. And then put a little, the tiniest, diet, tiniest little dot you can, that's Earth. And here it's, here's what's amazing about it. And I think Paul probably didn't know that under the inspiration of the Spirit he was saying this, but we have more reason today in 2023 to be in absolute awe of the cosmos than Paul did, and he was. Because we are looking out there, and there is no compelling evidence to say there's another life-bearing planet out there. What we have is so unique, so rare, so one of a kind, so accidental that I don't think anybody who's a true scientist really believes that SETI is going to result in anything. By the way, SETI is just our way of trolling the universe. Don't you think? <laughs> just beeping out there, making comments, you know, and nobody wants to respond to us. It's amazing. It's amazing. So Paul is trying to grab these guys. Think a little bit. You guys, God has given you brains. Think a little bit what you're saying, that you can somehow contain God in a little building or an idol. Heck no, you can't do that. You can't do that. So you found common ground with the Athenians who wanted to hedge their bets, and he makes the point that the true God of the, of the universe is uncontainable, right? We, we worship a song. We didn't do it today. If I had thought ahead, probably would have brought it in. It says about God, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky, and you know them by name. There's a lot of them. Billions of galaxies at least, and those billions of galaxies, according to Carl Sagan, have billions and billions and billions of stars, and God knows them all by name. Why wouldn't he? He is greater than all of the universe that we could possibly imagine in our mind. And that's what the Big Bang has done for us. A great video that I think is free online, just reference it. It's kind of old, and it could be updated. It's called The Privileged Planet. How many have seen that? There you go. It, it basically, it looks at this planet of ours, not as an accident, not as a lucky star, but as a, as a remarkable part of our universe that makes it very, very privileged. Then he goes on in verse 26 to remind us that we are all, each and every one of us, his children descended from one man. And by the way, biology even tells us that. We know that regardless of your view of the complexity of the origins of man, that we came from one man and one woman, if all the DNA studies shoot back, and it happens to be right there, right about the Middle East where the garden would be, which I think is absolutely Fascinating. We're all descended from one man. Then in verses 27 through 28, again, I like this passage because it's very, it's very biblical. When I say Paul wasn't, I, Paul didn't use overtly scripture in this sermon, but he's being very biblical here when he says, God did all this. He marked out the boundaries and he created everything so that we, we would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. That is so cool. When I'm sharing Christ, I take great comfort knowing that God is not far from anybody. And I kind of put it kind of sloppy this way. It's like God has moved in a billion miles towards us, and he just asks us to move, move an inch. <laughs> Get a good picture? He's come a billion miles, <laughs> more than that when we think of the size, you know, to, to confront us with the gospel, with his love and compassion. He just asks us to move an inch, and that inch is faith. It's the, and again, I've said it before, God is deciding the plan of salvation. What is the easiest thing I can ask men and women and young people to do that they have the volitional ability to do that would be the easiest thing that anybody could do? Would they have to go to school? Do they have to be wealthy? Do they have to be strong? Do they have to be smart? How about they just believe? What can be more difficult but yet so hard sometimes? I'm just going to believe that God is near each and every one of us. We also believe that he needs nothing from us. Verse 25, he's not served by human hands, as if we could do something for God. You know, I, I, I'm going to change the name of the person in this illustration. I used, to, I used to use Bill Gates, but that's old stuff. How about Elon Musk? He's a guy that's got a couple bucks in his pocket. 
Do you know who that is? He drives little cars. I think he shot a car in the universe, didn't he? Didn't he shoot one up there? Didn't he put a Tesla up in the universe? That's his way of reaching out to God. That's his way of worshiping. Lord, this is what I do. Here you go. You can have one. There's one up there somewhere floating around if it hasn't been sucked into the sun yet. But imagine that the Elon Musk hears of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Doug again. Hears of Doug's amazing craftsmanship skills, and they are amazing. Amazing. Not like me. I'm kind of a two-by-four guy. <laughs> Two-by-fours and 16 penny nails, and I'm good to go. And, he, and, and, and Doug is asked to come down. Where does he live? He's not a Seattle billionaire, is he? California, probably. Who knows? Doesn't matter. Let's just say he lives in Ferndale. <laughs> and, he's, and, Doug, and he said, I heard of Doug. And Doug's going to do some work for me. And Doug does the work, and he's really impressed. Thank you so much, Doug. You know, we, I've enjoyed getting to you and hearing about candy. And uh, I'd like to have you and candy over for dinner. We're going to have it just be us. Uh, I don't know. If, is there a Mrs. Musk? <laughs> there have been. I don't know. Don't go there. It's not a marriage sermon. <laughs> it's not a marriage sermon. So, okay, we're going to have we're going to have Doug and Candy for dinner and we're going to make a really nice dinner cuz we can and and why not? This this uh, this man came to our home and he just did a super job and and I got to know him. He's a really pleasant guy. I enjoyed talking to him. In fact, he, you know, we shared profound and deep things. Let's have a great dinner. And we did. And so, Doug and Candy come and and they have this wonderful spread and servants, and, the, and it's just the best meal you've ever had. Trust me, it is. It would be. And then it's over. And Doug's feeling rather grateful for the experience. And, so, and he goes, Mr. Must, thank you so much. If you don't mind, I'd like to pay for my dinner tonight. Is that awkward? Would that be clumsy? Would that be inappropriate? Yeah, you know, this is really good. What, probably my share is $100. I'm going to give you $200, Mr. Musk. I'm so grateful. Tacky, cringeworthy, inappropriate. You, we okay? Did I paint a picture here? That's what we are like when we try to pay God back with our works. When we say, you know, I'm going to do this because, what does it say here? He's not served by human hands. How could he possibly? Now, we do things for God. Now, we do appropriate things for God. I'm going to, you know, would you like me to take care of your other bathroom now? I'd be glad to come back and do your kitchen. I enjoy doing this. That's totally appropriate. But for us to say, I'm going to pay God in some way, he is not served by human hands. As if he needed anything. I love that. Rather, what does he do? He gives everyone life and breath and everything else. There's a three-point sermon there. Life and breath. And by the way, Russ, you've got to do a thing on air. You've done some stuff on air. Thank God for air. Are you glad there's air? You know, I wrote the other day, I wrote the other day, people complain about, you got to have water, and the water bills are so high, but what's more important than water is air. And fortunately, I haven't figured out how to regulate that yet. They will. They'll, we'll get a bill for air one of these days. I'm sure it's coming. Everything else is, is charged for. Okay, I'm really getting way off here. Getting toward the end here. Now, okay, verse 26, we're all descended from one man. But think about what that does to the issue of race and bigotry and prejudice. Because it says from one man, he made every nation. Every people group would be uh, maybe a better translation. Every ethnic culture, how do you not read this and, and go, what are we thinking when we, when we think less of some group of people because of skin color or, or a country of origins or something like that? What were we thinking? How do we, how do we not read this and go, we're idiots? One man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole world, the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries of their lands. We, we were born when and where God wanted us to be born. Isn't that weird? None of us chose, none of us here, I don't think, I'm looking at somebody with unique powers, chose where you were born. Anybody chose the place or the time? No. It happens when it happens. And if we believe in God's sovereignty, he's in charge of that. So he's not far from us. He makes a trip of a billion miles. We just have to move a fraction of an inch. 
And he goes on and he says he demonstrates his greatest, his greatest demonstration of his nearness and heart is in the incarnation of Jesus. He, he's not, he's, he's not, he, that phrase, he's not far from any of us, it's kind of a cutesy way of saying he's right there. He's right there. And his biggest evidence of that, John 1 verse 14 reminds us that he, he became one of us and he moved into our neighborhood, Peterson would say. Jesus Christ, God's incarnation in Christ, his life, death, resurrection, his presence now by his Holy Spirit. You can't get any closer than the Holy Spirit, his gift and grace to us. Then finally, our passage demonstrates his patience and his grace. It says, okay, in the past, in the past, I like this, God overlooked. There can't be two more gracious words than that, God overlooked. Anybody glad that God overlooked stuff when you were young? <laughs> I did a lot of things I didn't really know were wrong. I just didn't know until the gospel came in. God overlooks our ignorance. God overlooks such ignorance. But now, new dispensation after the cross, he commands all people everywhere to repent. Jew, Greek, male, or female. Because he set a day when he will judge. And he's appealing, he's appealing to people that didn't have the scriptures, but I think they knew in their heart. I, you know, I kind of knew in my heart. This, I'll tell you my theology. Before I was a Christian, before I even thought about giving my life to Jesus, I knew there was a judgment. I thought judgment would be, I had to watch a movie of my life over and over again. <laughs> I thought that would be punishment enough. That was my idea, judgment. And that you get to watch your life over and over again to see how miserable you lived your life. That that would be hell, right? Anybody would find that uncomfortable? If you don't, God bless you. But, so, but my point is, I knew there was judgment before I was a Christian. And he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed, that man, of course, the man, there's only one man, would be Jesus Christ. And he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Again, Stanley. If a man can predict his own death, or re death and resurrection and pull it off, I'm following that guy. Why, why wouldn't I? And then we end up with these people that get, that get saved and follow Jesus. And I think it leads to some takeaways. First takeaway is when we share Christ, some will receive it and believe. Some will reject it and not believe. And some just need more time. We actually noticed all three groups in that last part there. Some sneered, they rejected. Some said, we want to hear you again on the subject. They're reasoning it, they're thinking it through. And then some of them became followers of Paul, which of course meant followers of Jesus Christ. And he lists some of them right here. People we might get to meet in heaven someday. Pretty cool. Yeah, I've heard of you, whatever your name is. Uh, Dionysius and Damaris. You met Christ in Athens. That, that's, that's pretty cool. So here's, what, here's the takeaway. God is totally on your side when you share the gospel. When you, when you share it with an unbelieving spouse, when you share it with your children or your parents, it's clumsy and it's awkward. It feels weird when you have the courage to share it with a neighbor or someone at work or something like that. Know this, that as much as you have a passion, as little or as great of a passion you do for their lostness and their coming to Christ, God so much more. God is near to that person. Lord, I know you are near that person that I want to share the gospel with. So I'm going to trust that you are doing your work. You're near. You're not far. Amen? So as I close in prayer, I want you to think about two or three people that need Jesus, okay? Two or three people that need Jesus. And I want you to pray for them as I pray for all of us, okay? And as the band comes back up. Before the band comes, i got one more thing before the band comes up, so hang tight, band. Sorry about that. Father, thank you for this great chapter. This is a favorite chapter of preachers and theologians because it's so different. This confrontation with a society that didn't have scriptures but was really a bunch of smarty pants, people who studied philosophy and worshipped nearly, people like Aristotle and Socrates and Plato and, and others. Uh, this is an amazing culture of achievement in terms of the literature and the sciences. And Paul goes right into the belly of the beast to say, 
you're missing it. You're missing it. And the God that you're seeking after, the one that you don't have a name for, he's not far from any of us. Lord, I want to pray for the people who have just been thought about in our prayer time. Pray, Lord, that we would believe that you are near to them, that you are more committed to their uh, salvation, their coming to Jesus than we are. That you would give us the wisdom to know when to use scripture and when to just use thoughtful common sense. It may even be this truth of, of the passage here, which really refers to the Big Bang. Everything was created at a single point. And if there's a Big Bang, there should be a Big Banger out there who caused it all. That's, that's Yahweh. It's God. And it's illogical. I'm always thinking it's illogical. I think if there are many gods, if there were many gods, mine is the God on top. Mine's the only one who has existed forever and ever. He is the uncreated God. The rest are demons. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. And I just pray, I'm just going to pray here for the folks that are being thought about. Touch them with the gospel. Save them. Restore them. Put them into happy fellowship in a local church. Make them effective in themselves, sharing the gospel the rest of their lives. And I pray this in your name and God's put together said, Amen. cool chapter, eh? So we got something quick to do. We have the privilege of introducing the church to a couple new members. And I was going to do that a little earlier. So as you look around, you go, who could that be? Bruce and Linda, come on up the front for a second. <laughs> I always like to share, I met Bruce first um, at my first ever um, campaign kickoff yeah. about 13, 14 years ago. Oh, okay. And this guy shows up. And I go, oh, he's lost, right? <laughs> We're out in the middle of a cluster in a, in a field. They, we, had that, we had a band out there and all sorts of goofy things. Were you part of that? And the band played. I remember doing something like that. And I met this guy, and you've been kind of trolling me ever since. It's my word of the day, <laughs> trolling. And uh, you guys have been coming here for several years. and. Yeah. And said, you know, this is our home, and we'd like to make a difference. So we want to welcome you and bless you. We have a couple certificates Thank of you. membership right there. And would you like to say anything? You don't have to, but... Uh, we're not perfect, but we're forgiven. Amen. Yeah. Let's, let's stand. I'm going to pray for Bruce and Linda. I love these people. They're just across the street, a block down, so see them all the time. And um, I'm going to pray for them. As I'm praying, the band can come back up. We do have one more song for you. A brand new song which is a great title, Multiply. We want to multiply, and we can multiply next week if we all invite two or three friends to soup. I've talked to Deidre today. She couldn't be here today, but she plans to bring a whole busload next week. So let's not let Deidre take over here. Let's, <laughs> let's bring some of our home folks if you know what it be. That's not a word, didn't it? Oh, well. <laughs> Father, thank you for Bruce and Linda. We just love them. They're just so friendly and cheerful, and they come here regularly and always, and and I just am so blessed by them. So I'm going to pray that their membership here would just be an example to all of us to love you first, to love our families and each other, and to love this church and to serve it and make a difference. Help us to see in us, recognize in us faithfulness of our Christianity too, and that their membership is a reminder and challenger to us to, uh, to, to live the Christian life. Bless our church, bless the rest of our service, and bless Bruce and Linda Mooney, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Every church should have Moonies, I think. There you go. So. <laughs>
His offering stretch across the skies. These hallelujahs be multiplied. These hallelujahs be multiplied. Your love is like radiant time on bursting inside us. We cannot contain your love in surely confined us like blazing wildfire. Singing your name, God of mercy, sweet love of mine. I have surrendered to your design. May this offering stretch across. to fly God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your design. May this offering stretch across the sky. That's a good tune. I like it so much. May God be with you. May God bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you by bringing people into your life that you know in your heart you need to tell them about Jesus. May he rekindle a fresh passion for the lost in your life my life, people, and family, friends that don't know you. We get kind of comfortable with that. Lord, make us uncomfortable like Paul walking into Athens, seeing all this lostness and hedonism and idols and just broke his heart. May you give us the same type of broken heart that at the same time has the faith to know that you are with us. Amen? Amen. We'll see you next week, Soup Sunday, and looking forward to it.